the only the only housekeeping thing that I need you to know is that you know I'm out I'm out here in rural America, and our Wi-Fi is sketchy sometimes. And often when I do these in the course of an hour, it'll freeze me out maybe twice. Yeah, I have no idea where we're going to go, but that's, that's the beauty of the process itself. Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. This week, we have two super special guests talking about something that we all need to care about, and that's whether or not the American agriculture system and all the things that the government has done to it is going to allow us to continue to feed our families healthy food. Today, we have Congressman Thomas Massey, longtime friend of the show, who is the author of legislation called the Prime Act, and we're going to talk about that. Um, another guest, one that I've wanted to get on this show for a long time, and one of the blessings of the coronavirus is that we were able to get Joel Salatin, the so-called lunatic farmer, uh, proprietor at Poly, Polyface Farms. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, Matt. Great. Great. All right. So let's, uh, let's jump right into this. And I thought, Joel, it might make sense for you to just take a minute and explain to people a little bit about who you are in your your farm philosophy um, so that that we have some context for this conversation. Sure. Well, for those that aren't familiar, uh, our farm is in the in Virginia Shenandoah Valley. Uh, so we're about three miles from Washington, D.C., uh, close enough to be dangerous, but far enough to not be within gunshot. And uh, and so uh, we, we're, in, we're in pastured livestock. So our family came here in 1961 to a worn out uh, pile of gullies and rocks. And uh, dad was a genius. You know, it's, I'm, I'm at the stage in my life when I look back and realize the older I get, the smarter, smarter dad was. And uh, so that's kind of where I am. And, um, and he, he, was, he was organic before Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and before we had a, you know, a government certification program or anything. And uh, we're looking at this rock pile and gullies and saying, how do we heal this? And so they're pretty simple principles. You know, every ecology needs animals. Animals move. If animals move, you got to have mobile, mobile control, mobile shelter, um, you know, mobile water. And so this set us on this path of, of innovative mobility uh, for infrastructure and uh, multi-speciation, direct marketing. He realized he, he was an economist by training and realized as a small farmer, we couldn't compete with the commodity low margins. We had to wear the, the middleman hats. We had to be the processor, uh, distributor, and marketer, and, and, and wear all those hats in order to make, a, to make money, to make a living on a small farm. And so we started down that path. He never made a living from the farm. He and mom, mom was a school teacher, but they used their off-farm jobs to pay for the land. So when Teresa and I got married in 1980, we had this raw land, but not a going concern, but a great, you know, uh, legacy of experimentation and, and basic ideas that we knew could work. And so, um, so I came back, we came back to the farm full time, lived in the attic upstairs in a completely uninspected, unapproved, uh, um, you know, gorilla living situation without a television, driving a, a $50 car and uh, $300 a month. And devoted ourselves to, you know, to healing this place, direct marketing, building a brand. And today we now service about 50 restaurants, most of which are now out of business, and um, and a customer base of, of uh, you know, four or five thousand families. We ship uh, anywhere in the nation. There are about 20 of us involved, and um, and we're a, you know, a, a about yeah 20 of us full-time we do a, a very formal you know professional apprenticeship program germinating young farmers as well and uh, we have beef pork chicken uh, both meat and eggs uh, turkey lamb duck and uh, forestry products and anything else we can cobble together to pay the tax bill <laughs> so um, you probably know this but wikipedia claims that you once described yourself as a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. Is that about capture it? <laughs> yeah, I came, I came up with that moniker 
because I got very tired of doing, you know, I'm this organic farmer, I'm this poster boy organic farmer. And as a result, I'd go in to do, uh, I speak a lot around the world and I'd go in and they'd assume that, well, he's an organic farmer. So he must be, you know, a liberal Democrat, foodie, greeny, uh, tree hugging, abortion loving, uh, uh, big government, um, you know, all these things. And I got tired of that and said, wait a minute, you know, don't, don't put me in a box. And so I kind of came up with that as a humorous way to, uh, you know, to, to build bridges and help people to understand, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a pigeonhole. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, I realized this when we were getting ready for this interview that I first discovered your blog, uh, Lunat the lunatic farmer, Dot com. I recommend it to everybody, but I discovered it because when we, a couple of years ago, we were making a documentary about Thomas Massey's farming techniques and his philosophy of life. And he's wearing a very sweaty, dirty uh, shirt that says <laughs> lunatic farmer on it. So I had to Google it. Like, who's that guy? That sounds kind of cool. Um, Congressman, I feel like you need to just take a minute and remind people that long before you went to Mordor and started wearing that evil pin, you were, in fact, farming your own land. Yeah, you know, uh, I grew up in these hills that you see back here and uh, wanted to build things. So I ended up going to MIT and getting into the high tech world. Um, and after that, uh, my wife and I wanted to move back to Kentucky. So we moved back here which on the farm that she grew up on. And she had grown up raising tobacco and beef cattle. Well, tobacco's out of fashion here in Kentucky. It's not profitable anymore. And um, we focused on the beef cattle part of it. And I saw that farmers were taking their cattle to the auction house and basically selling them quite frequently for less than what it cost them to produce them. And I thought, well, I don't want to get on that treadmill. So I looked at the organic movement and I thought, well, maybe I could raise these um, animals organically and find a niche market. But one day I was in Kroger's shopping with my wife and I picked up a bottle of apple juice and it was organic and I put it in the shopping cart. Well, by the time we got to the next aisle, I looked at it and it said it was made in Turkey and, you know, the country of Turkey. And I thought, well, how in the hell do they know how this was raised and if it's any good? And so um, that sent me on a quest and I found Joel Salatin's books. Uh, the first book that I found is still my favorite. It's called Everything That I Want to Do is Illegal, War Stories from the Food Farming Front. And um, so I started studying the way that Joel's farming, and I decided that it made a lot of sense. And when my farm back here grows up, it wants to be polyface farms. Um, but in the meantime, and I've been raising cattle and, and trying to direct market that. Now, sometimes I get busy in Washington, D.C., and I have to take the cattle to the auction house and sell them if I've not done a, uh, haven't had the time to market them. And that always hurts. It's a, it's a constant reminder of how a lot of farmers are, are living. And so um, I've been inspired to try and do more of this marketing. But in the process of all of that, I discovered a bottleneck um, in, the, in the processing facilities. They're, it's basically bifurcated. There's the USDA facilities and the non-USDA facilities. And um, that's what inspired legislation um, that I've introduced. But here recently, I think everybody's finding out what the, how brittle that, that bridge is that goes from farmers to consumers, which by the way, Joel's completely built his own bridges to do that. Yeah, so like two months ago when, when governors started locking down entire economies um, I, I wrote a piece where I quoted, I'm an economist, I'm not a farmer, so don't, don't judge me and, and be kind. But uh, I was uh, quoting one of my favorite economists, Frederick Bastiat, who was writing about Paris in the 1800s. And he asked the question, how is Paris fed? And he started talking about this incredibly complex, bottom-up, decentralized uh, division of labor that ensured that everybody in Paris was fed, even though they really had no idea how that food got to their tables. And I was applying that same logic to the, to the world that we live in today, which is infinitely more complex. And looking at, at governors and other politicians and bureaucrats deciding for us what was essential and non-essential 
And I predicted back then that, that there was going to be a problem with getting food on our tables. I just went to uh, Costco a couple of days ago, um, and they're rationing chickens, they're rationing pork, they're rationing beef. Uh, I go to Whole Foods and there's, there's no food, uh, there's very little meat on the shelves there. And, and Congressman, you, you predicted this a long time ago. Yeah, well, you know, I introduced a bill five years ago that would have ameliorated all of this. But when the coronavirus started happening, I did predict it. The first thing we saw was that milk was being poured out because, you know, milk has a very short shelf life. And it was because there was uh, primarily there was a shift in the type of demand. It went uh, half, you know, the dairy products were going into the restaurant industry and that ceased to uh, be there. And so farmers were pouring out their milk. And I, the, I well, looked an, at another big one, Tom, was that 7% of fluid milk in America goes into uh, public schools. And so uh, when the schools closed, se you know, 7% doesn't sound like much, but when you have a daily, you know, a daily, uh, whatever commodity that's, I mean, let's just for sake of discussion, let's say uh, 10 million gallons, 7% of 10 million gallons is a lot of milk. It's a lot of milk. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great point. And you can't just not milk your cows. You, you have to milk them every day. Uh, and, and here's the other thing, Joel, everybody spilled a glass of milk. And, and they say, don't cry over spilled milk, and most people don't. But what I realized when I saw the milk being poured out is the same thing was going to happen to chickens and pork and, and ev eventually beef. It's not really happened with beef yet, but it's, it happened with chickens. They started just breaking the eggs that were going to become hatchlings. They right. started gassing chickens that were ready to butcher, and they're killing tens of thousands of hogs every day in Iowa. Uh, one of the representatives up there tells me who's been to the facilities. And I, I predicted all of that would happen because I saw the same thing was going to happen. And I thought, you know, people don't get too upset when milk gets spilled, but when they see animals being wasted, they're going to get really upset. And I was hoping this is what would snap everybody back to their senses, but that still hasn't happened. Well, you know, um, uh, I think Matt, as an economist, it, it's interesting that, that you mentioned uh, Bastiat uh, and the and the complexity of Paris's uh, grassroots, uh, you know, grassroots bottom up um, uh, feeding system, <clears throat> and and you mentioned that today it's even more complex. And um, I don't want to get in an argument over it, but I would just say that today's in a lot of ways, it's much more simplified. We've we've tried to simplify something that was very beautifully diverse and kind of self-regulating. Uh, and we've made it extremely, we've tried to simplify it, which is the industrial way. And, uh, maybe, and that's- Maybe maybe centralized is a better word than- Well, well yes, well, cer certainly centralized. Yes, absolutely centralized. Uh, but the, the centralization and the amalgamation has created a brand new, um, heretofore unknown fragility in, in the in the whole uh, food chain, you know, when when uh, John Tyson, CEO and uh, legacy owner of uh, Tyson Foods, gets in front of a CNN camera on in public and says our food system is broken, that's a pretty big deal because, you know, for those of us in the I'll just say the uh, you know the alternative uh, food movement, uh, you know. It, what he represents, they spend their lives making fun of, <laughs> of, of uh, our smallness and our, you know, backwardness and all this stuff. And uh, so to hear that admission is is actually quite profound. Well, let's let you. That, I think that's a perfect point. And and I didn't know this actually when I wrote the piece, but I I probably should have as a as a student of of how government can. Get involved and centralize things and collectivize things and and respond to lobbyists instead of allowing uh, that decentralized system to work. And it turns out that the the meat processing industrial complex is is a real problem. And you you say it's fragile. Uh, explain how it works now and and maybe a little bit of how how we created this mess in the first place. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll let 
I'll let Congressman Massey take a shot at this. I'll just I'll just open it up and say and say that right now in the United States, perhaps the only the only place, the only places in the country right now that are having daily shoulder to shoulder thousands of people concentrated are the mega processing facilities. And so, um, I mean, we might get into a discussion of the virus and, and how much of it's true and hoax and all that, but, 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 but certainly concentration is a vector for all sorts of things, the virus notwithstanding. And, yeah. and, so, and so just imagine if instead of having 100 mega processing facilities employing 4,000 people uh, to, to do all of our food, if instead we had 200,000 20 person processing facilities uh, um uh can i say uh food distance <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know around the landscape uh you know it, it would be a, it would be a totally different vector and uh vulnerability uh within the system yeah yeah so um and let me point out that about 80 percent of all the meat that is consumed in the united states goes through four companies and these companies have monopolized the meat processing business in the United States. Two of them are wholly owned uh, foreign entities. One's owned by the Chinese and one is owned by uh, the Brazilians. And um, what we have now is not really the product of capitalism. This isn't an efficient result of capitalism. This is the result of uh, when the government starts enabling um, these so it's, it's cronyism basically, but it's done through regulation. And the government will tell you, we're doing this for your own good, but the lobbyists for the big meat packers, the four that control the industry right now, they want these regulations. They'd probably invite more regulations if they could, because what they understand is that it keeps the small guys from competing. And so they want a meat processing facility that might have only 10 employees to be regulated in the same way that their thousand employee facility is regulated. And so by making sure that the USDA never relaxes requirements for the smaller, uh, the smaller entities, they have forced the smaller entities into sort of this niche area of food processing. And right now, if you wanna use a custom slaughterhouse that doesn't have a full-time USDA employee, you, you have to own the animal. So the, the existing loophole for beef and pork, and there's, a, there's another sort of loophole that keeps everybody in a niche market for chickens, but the loophole for beef and pork and lamb is that you can go to a farmer and buy an animal and then have that animal processed yourself. And the government says, okay, we won't prevent that transaction from happening. But if you try to sell any of that in a restaurant, or in a, a grocery store, we will take you to jail. Or, and, or if that, or if that same neighbor says, you know, I can't afford a whole animal. I just want three T-bone steaks and five pounds of hamburger off of that animal. That is illegal. Right. And and here's the irony of it: people have to buy half a cow or a quarter of a yeah. cow, and um, nobody ever gets sick from eating half a cow. And, and people are worried that if we just sell them a hamburger that they'll get sick, but the hamburger came, comes out of the same half of a cow that's far healthier than what you get, uh, and traceable for instance, than what you get from the mega facilities. Those mega facilities are slaughtering thousands of animals a day. And if any one single one of them has a disease and the meat gets commingled, then you have these giant recalls uh, which you've seen in the past. By the way, all of the recalls come from USDA facilities, USDA and you know, fully inspected facilities. Yeah, the average, the average McDonald's hamburger contains pieces of 600 animals. <laughs> 600 animals. Uh, when you get one from us or one of Tom Massey's uh, hamburger, you know, uh, a ground beef, uh, it comes from one animal. So the, 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 the simple, you know, um, uh, mathematical chances of error of problem are are exponentially decreased when we go to a when we go to a smaller um, a smaller and that's why there aren't people getting sick and there aren't any recalls and and you just don't you don't read about these kinds of things i think the uh, 
philosophically, the thing that really what you know frustrates me about this is that these regulations are scale scale prejudicial, and I like to use very strong language to get gets people's attention, and you know, nobody wants to be prejudicial, um, but but they are scale prejudicial, and we have lots of exemptions for size. For example, in in Virginia here. I can keep three children in my home as a daycare without inspection because anybody knows if all I've got is three kids, I'm probably dealing straight with the parents. It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a familial type of arrangement. Same thing for elder care. We, we have all sorts of, of special carve outs for recognizing that, that tiny uh, is different. I mean, a, a, a tiny house, I mean, even the regulations for a, for a, a tiny structure are different than if you're building a you know a, a big structure and, and so we have lots of those and but in the in the meat business there really aren't any carve outs in this regard and so it forces everyone into this uh industrial scale um uh you know environment that is highly scale prejudicial Somebody might ask, well, give me a, give me a scale non-prejudicial regulation. All right, here's a good one. Speed limits. It doesn't take any more effort to push the brake or the gas on an 18-wheeler as it does a, a, a Prius, okay? That's, that's a non-scalable, non uh, uh, non-scale you know, prejudicial. So, so the, the idea of recognizing a different scale is not only appropriate, it, it's actually scientifically sensible. And scale, and scale can be uh, measured by distance as well. So, uh, you know, let me get, jump right into the legislation that I've offered here, which is called the Prime Act. And by the way, this, this bill was conceived on Joel Salatin's farm. I was visiting there and there was a legislator from Tennessee. His name is Frank Nicely. He's a state senator who's accomplished a lot in, in Tennessee for farmers. And um, we decided that we needed to have some scale appropriate regulations for the little guys. And um, so what my bill says is that if, if the farmer and the processor and the consumer are, are all in the same state and the product doesn't cross state lines and the, everybody is complying with state and county and city laws, then the USDA doesn't need to be involved in that transaction. The, the regulations that are placed on these Chinese and Brazilian companies that slaughter thousands of animals and ship them all over the world don't need to be the same regulations that are placed on the small local guys. And by the way, the local guys are inspected as well. The, the one that I use just three miles here from my farm, uh, he's inspected by the health department, just like a restaurant would be. Right. We don't have USDA inspectors in restaurants. We don't have them, you know, full time and we don't have them full time in your grocery store. Yet a restaurant or a grocery store might process more food than the local processor does here. Uh, so uh, my local processor, he is he's inspected by the local health department. And um, if there were state laws, a state inspection, he'd be inspected by those. There aren't state inspections. But he's also subject to surprise inspections by the USDA. And he tells, tells me he's been through one of those. They just show up unannounced and say, we want to look around. He says, OK, I got nothing to hide. And so um, when, it, when we talk about uninspected uh, non-USDA facilities, these are, actually, you, these are actually inspected facilities. They just don't have a full-time employee there. And they don't, maybe they don't check everything off on the big list that the USDA well, has. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's actually a lot of that um, checking off. We, uh, we actually own about a 42% interest in a small federal inspected slaughterhouse that we use here in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and um, have about 20 employees. It's a small, it's a small community um, abattoir. And the difference in, in cost uh, between having all that federal inspection paperwork versus a custom processing, which is where, where we're actually doing it for, uh, you know, an animal that's already got a name on it before it was killed, um, is about 30%. It's a huge, huge difference in cost 
because the, the paperwork and liability overheads of meeting the inspector requirements for temperature tracking control infrastructure is, is, um, is way higher than the, than the, the gentler custom uh, situation. So we do both at our plant and we charge about 30, a substantial difference, 30% difference. Uh, you start doing that on a carcass weight, you know, you translate that to actually by the pound, it's, you know, it becomes uh, 50% 50, 50 uh, difference. I mean, it can easily be as much as 50 to 70 cents a pound worth of retail difference with these two things. So now not only is this size prejudicial, it's poverty prejud prejudicial. So a, per a person who can't afford our federal inspected ground beef could get, if, 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 we, if we went through the custom, the, 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 um, the, the custom designation, they could get that for 50 to 70 cents a pound less. That's substantial for a, you know, for an economically disadvantaged person. Now, I'm, I'm assuming uh, what Congressman Massey was describing earlier, economists would call regulatory capture, where big corporations not only embrace regulation, but promote additional regulation because they have armies of lawyers and lobbyists and, and accountants and all that other stuff. And it, it's very much, uh, it, it centralizes things and it screws the little guy. Um, I would assume that there's an army of these guys right now making sure that Congressman Massey and Joel Salatin don't have their way in terms of in terms of breaking up this this meat processing cartel. Um, they're going to say it's not safe and it's going to be more expensive. You just addressed the the cost issue. What do you, what do you say about the safety concern? Well, just look at the data. You, the big recalls happen from the USDA um, fully inspected facilities, the giant processors, not the small ones. Um, I've never heard of anybody even, you know, getting sick from going through a small processor. And also there's this, this chain of accountability. You can know who the farmer was when you, when you go through a local facility because it's a local farmer and, you know, it's cheaper, it's cheaper that way, frankly, and it's much greener um, to use a local facility. By the way, the only USDA facility that I've been able to use is three hours from my house. I've got a custom facility that's three minutes from my house. And then I've got this USDA facility that's three hours from my house. So th this isn't even in the cost calculation that Joel's talking about yet. When I have to load up two animals and, and spend all that gas money to get there and back pulling a trailer on the interstate, uh, that's not very green <laughs> when you think about it. Right. But on the safety right. issue, um, local is is safer in my opinion yeah well again there's there's simply a bit of um inherent safety in just smaller batch smaller batch food processing i mean the difference between canning green beans in your kitchen from your garden at you know seven quarts per canner full i think that's what a lot of them carry you know seven quarts uh versus uh jolly green giant bringing in a tractor trailer load of green beans that the, the capacity for, you know, for fly wings and legs and deer poop and you know, all the things that can get in there. Um, the, the, the difference capacity is incredible, you know, compared to if it's, you know, if, if it's me and mama looking at them in the floating in the sink, you know, and we're kind of watching this. And so, so intuitively we understand, uh, we understand, both economies of scale in manufacturing, but also the diseconomies of scale when it comes to cleanliness, sanitation, biology, goodness, teaching. I mean, think about, oh, we've got a great teacher in our classroom. She's such a great teacher. Um, let's, let's give her all hundred kindergartners to teach because she's a great teacher. Well, you're not gonna have the same thing happen in a hundred kids in the classroom. Uh, even no matter how good the teacher is compared to if you have 15 in there, it's a different experience. It's a different thing. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and the fact is that a lot of the, um, 
whatever the uh, the elite the elitism taint on local food is not production oriented. It's this thing that uh, that Thomas just mentioned. Uh, I mean, in our county, in our county, you cannot raise a a, a steer and a beef animal. You cannot raise a beef animal in our county. And and process it here and sell a pound of ground beef to a friend at church legally. It, get, it has to be exported from the county to the federal inspected facility, re-imported in order to sell it to a friend at church. That's... Yeah. Uh, and, and a great thing that, and, that, and what I like that's anti-environmental. Yeah. One of the things that I like that Joel points out in his book is you can give away the hamburgers at church. That's totally legal. You could you can use a local processor and that's not USDA inspected, get your hamburgers made and take them to a, a little league game and give them away. And there's no there's no law that prevents it. It's only when you start charging one penny that now you've run afoul of the government. And that tells you what it's about. It's all about the money. Uh, by the way, the, speaking of the money and the, and the armies of people in Washington, D.C. that oppose my bill to right-size the regulation for the little guys, uh, one of the objections that I've heard from uh, some of the high-ranking congressmen, who I would say are captured by the lobbyists, and also from the USDA, I've talked to them directly, is that we would run afoul of the WTO and the USTR if we pass my bill. They're saying that if you give any sort of relief to uh, local farmers and local processors, that um, what we've done now is we've created unfair tr trade practices because we've got requirements on the beef and pork that's imported. So they say we can't reduce any of our own requirements or else we'll get in trouble with them. And then they also say when our farmers want to export to Japan or to Europe, that Europe oftentimes uses this sort of regulation to keep our products out. And so that we would see more of that and it would become some sort of trade war. And so that that's one of the things that they put forward reasons that they can't entertain my bill. You know, I, um, I, I assume that most of the local processing that we're talking about probably has very little to do with international trade and, and we <laughs> maybe shouldn't get into these massive trade agreements and how they continuously regulate up to the, to the highest regulatory burden. But, but I am thinking about the fact that I, I doubt very many Americans know that that Smithfield, the pork that they buy at Costco, I think that's the brand that I buy when I go to Costco, is a Chinese company. And that as a Chinese company, and I guess this was part of part of a trade deal of sort of easing the restrictions on China, uh, they've been sending a lot of pork back to China about the same time that our shelves have gone empty I got to believe that that's kind of a political time bomb for Republicans and Democrats who are sort of clinging to the current system. I think that is a time bomb. I, I saw something in Reuters yesterday that said that exports of pork to China have quadrupled during this period of time, yet our capacity to produce or process pork has been cut by 40 percent and farmers are having to euthanize and destroy their animals. So that's not going to sit well. The other thing that I don't think should sit well with folks, if they think this through, is the president used the Defense Production Act to order the companies to stay open. Now, he didn't send Mike Pence down there to run the companies. That was more about absolving them of any liability from their employees. Now, think of the irony of this. This is a Chinese company that's hiring American workers and the president just told all the American workers, you can't sue the Chinese company for uh, unfair labor practices or if they put you in an in a unsafe situation. I think that's sort of a time bomb as well. Yeah. Well, it strikes me that, that your legislation isn't trying to replace the, the current system so much as it's, uh, it's allowing for alternatives to the current system at the local level um, which is going to which is going to make the entire system more robust. It's going to ensure that that supply and demand are are going to continue 
to produce food on tables as we deal with uh, ongoing coronavirus. The, the governor of New York just announced that they're going to keep locking down until June now. I don't, I'm not sure that certain politicians who jumped on this lockdown thing even know what their exit strategy is because the standard they set was uh, is now we have to have a vaccine, we have to have zero lives lost, and it's hard to imagine a world where that it ever becomes safe enough for them to, to let us free to create food again. Let me, let me throw something out like there a for Joel. Farmer. No, for Joel, Joel's uh, been farming far more than I have, and, and he would probably, uh, he definitely understands this more than me. So I'd like to get his thoughts on it. But I think this problem is not short lived. I think this is going to be with us for six months, maybe a year. And here's why I think that. Um, I see that farmers are not breeding back their sows and they are causing their sows with chemical injections to, to abort piglets. Well, those aren't piglets that were going to be, you know, in the meat supply tomorrow. Those were piglets that were going to be in the meat supply six months from now. And the, the hatcheries aren't hatching the eggs. And, and you know, those take 12, 21 days to hatch and then eight weeks to raise the bird. That's meat that's not uh, going to be produced. So right now the pipeline is cramped at the processors. The processors can't process the slaughter-ready animals that farmers have. So the so animals are being wasted. But the farmers are responding rationally to this kink in the pipeline. And they are decreasing production. In fact, at the USDA facility that's three hours from my house, I took a couple steers there last week, I saw dairy cattle being turned into hamburger. And these weren't old dairy cattle. These were dairy cattle that needed to be milked that morning. Instead, they were going into hamburger. And you can't just replace a dairy cow overnight when things get back to normal, if they ever do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that the this this slinky, this kind of slinky effect, is going to uh, is going to stay with us simply because these are biological things. You can't you can't grow a cow in a day. You can't grow a chicken in a day. Uh, it's not like you know. Let's just run the manufacturing plant twenty four seven and make more widgets. And so uh, yeah, I think there's going to be a fairly long tail. It's interesting. Of course, you know we we direct market to about. 5,000 families. So we really have our pulse on the urban, what's the urban sector thinking? What are, the, what are our customers telling us? And, um, and like every other farmer like us around the nation, we're, we're slammed. I mean, our retail is up 300%. We can't keep stuff in inventory. Goodness, for the first time in our whole farm career, we ran out of ground beef uh, two weeks ago for three days. And, um, and, and you know, our customers panicked and, and everything else. Uh, and and what, we're, what we're hearing is are things like, how can I, how can I buy first class uh, accommodations at, at your farm? Can I pay you a $500 a year insurance fee? And that will ensure that I'm, 10, I'm, I'm at your top 10% customer base. So, you know, so that you'll take care of me no matter what. I mean, people are genuinely, they're, they're, they're scared. They're, they're genuinely scared for the first time um, in my memory of, of the stores that shelves are going to be empty. We had one call us who said, if I buy a 40 foot shipping van and put a, re, a, a freezer unit in that, how fast can you fill a 40 foot freezer van, uh, you know, freezer uh, container? Yeah. <laughs> Man, you know, we just can't, we, we can't do that on a dime, but that's what pe is going through people's minds right now. So, you know, it's a, it's a real cultural, it, it's a jarring, it's a jarring of the culture. And, and yeah. if I could go back to one thing that Thomas said that is so important to realize is because safety is such a big deal. People say, oh, if you give some freedom, we're not going to have safety anymore. That's another whole kind of a, you know, a rabbit trail to go down. Um, a la, you know, Benjamin Franklin, those who give up liberty for security get neither. But um, his point, I want to just just put an exclamation mark on his point that if you sell it for a dollar, you can give it away. But if you sell it for a dollar, um, that's illegal. And what we've done is in our um, like hazardous substances, drugs, okay, um, 
we have a prohibition on both both buying and selling. If we say something is hazardous, we put some sort of stipulation on both both procuring and selling it. In food, all of the prohibitions are only on selling it. There are no prohibitions on buying it. If I can figure out how to buy it on the black market and feed it to my children, that's perfectly legal. Nobody's ever going to come in and fine me or, or prosecute me for a crime. It's only on the seller. So as Thomas Massey said, this is not about safety. It is about regulating market access for who can play the game. You know, Joel, you mentioned something about uh, uh, you were a direct supplier to a number of restaurants in, in your region. And I think I'm actually in your region. I'm in the belly of the beast in Washington, D.C. Sure. Um, and that a lot of those restaurants had gone out of business. I got to assume that if you're euthanizing chickens and, and, uh, and aborting piglets, that that has a huge impact on your viability as a producer of food. And so that's, well, that's another ripple effect that's going to be hard to put back together again. Well, sure. Well, but may it, um, let's make a point here. We are not. We're, we're getting, we're, we're raising more chicks and pigs and cows. I mean, we're, we're, we're scavenging up animals. I mean, we can't begin to, uh, we can't begin to supply the need right now. I mean, we, we have never been short of eggs. Uh, I just talked to an out to, to the largest pastured egg producer in the country in California a couple of weeks ago, and and they're only being able to supply 30 percent of the of their egg demand in the springtime. That's never happened in history, and so so this glitch this glitch is not about production. There is plenty of food in the countryside. It, it's a it's a complete breakdown of a segregated a segregated, simplistic, uh, overregulated chain from the farmer to the plate that's, that's well, uh, Thomas said, a bottleneck. It, 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 it's, yeah. it's a bottleneck in the system, and it's completely, it's completely uh, fabricated. It, it, it's not inherent. It doesn't have to be. It, doesn't, yeah. it can be cured so easily, and yet here we are. And I, I have one restaurant owner in my district she has eight employees and, you're, and um, her supplier can't supply her. So she is um, sending her employees to Costco or Sam's Club, but you can only buy two packages of meat at a time. So she has to, <laughs> like, they're straw purchasers for their boss. They are sneaking into the grocery stores and buying two packages each, you know, spaced an hour apart. And that's how she's supplying her restaurant. That's kind of ridiculous. And meanwhile, you've got other farmers, not Joel, not me, who have to euthanize their animals because they're plugged in to the meat processing yes. cabal that's owned by the Chinese and the Brazilians that's failing now. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, um, you know, you guys know this quote, but uh, Barack Obama's uh, former chief of staff once said, never go a crisis, uh, let a crisis go to waste. And it strikes me that everything we've talked about so far, I'm learning things that I didn't know, but I guarantee you that the American people who are at Costco wondering why meat is rationed have no idea that the government has created this system and created this very centralized, uh, brittle process that, that's preventing them from getting food directly from farmers. So is there a point here? And I'm thinking specifically Joel, you just wrote a blog post on May 7th. Just, I don't know what day it is because I'm in quarantine, but uh, it, that sounds recent. Uh, and it says- it Was says, that a Sunday? Who knows? <laughs> I don't even know. A coronavirus blessing. And I, I love this, this little essay and you come up with six or seven points. Maybe one of our blessings here is that we can fix something that should have been fixed five years ago when the Congressman introduced this legislation we can break up that that iron grip cartel of, of lobbyists in the in the meat processing industrial complex and and free farmers and consumers to actually solve this problem on their own self. Yes, I can assure you that any injection of freedom and, and wiggle room that we inject into the food system right now, especially for local for, for, for lo to, to stimulate local interface. 
uh, will create an explosion of, of regional, regional commerce uh, and, and security and, um, and, and resilient, uh, resiliency in the system. Uh, anything we can do in the Prime Act is a, you know, it's, it's a great, it's such a benign, to me, it's so obvious and simple. It's such a benign, easy first step that, uh, that the fact that people are still pushing back is uh, almost uh, unspeakable. And, though, and they're pushing back while millions of animals are going to be wasted and euthanized. And by the way, Matt, this is, the, um, these changes that we need to make need to be permanent changes. Somebody asked me, can the USDA give some special exemptions here while we're in the, this virus situation? <laughs> and, and the answer is they could, but entrepreneurs aren't going to respond to that. You wouldn't run out and start a meat processing facility, or if you'd shut one down, you wouldn't even reopen it. You wouldn't turn the lights back on if it were just, um, you knew it was going to be temporary. And so if entrepreneurs are going to respond to this, uh, by the way, I've had people tell me, you know what? I used to run a, a facility. I shut it down. But if you pass the Prime Act, I can have it open again in five weeks. Okay. Right. And this is, somebody that's done it before so they know what they're talking about. So the response wouldn't be immediate. They're still, like Joel said, this slinky, and they're still going to be, in the next few weeks, they're going to be hundreds of thousands of animals wasted and put through wood chippers and composted and liquefied and not go into the food supply. But this solution would start kicking in today, and it would become more and more of a solution as time goes on. But it has to be a solution after this crisis. Otherwise, the entrepreneurs aren't going to respond and put their blood, sweat, and tears into opening uh, more of these facilities or into expanding their existing facilities. There's been a fast. Well, the other thing, yeah. The, the other thing is that if it's a if it's a if it's a proper response in this crisis, it's a proper response in any crisis. Right. And and what we need to be, I hope that what we're learning from this is let's let's take the vulnerabilities that we've learned from this crisis and, and let's see if we can uh, uh, attack them or ameliorate them directly because the idea that, well, this will be our last crisis and we'll never have another one uh, is, just, uh, is just crazy. Hey, Matt, I know you're moderating the show, but there's one question I get more than any other question. And we've got the man in the conversation who can answer it uh, for everybody. And the question I get is why are farmers destroying their animals? Why don't they just keep them around until the problem is over? And uh, you know, Joel, can you answer what happens if you if you keep a Cornish cross like a few extra weeks? Or well, well, uh, all, all animals have a growth have a have a growth trajectory, just like humans. And uh, so, so you know, it's at some point they stop growing and just just keep eating. And so there's absolutely no economic justification. There's no reasonable justification to continue feeding an animal when it, when it, when it doesn't grow anymore. Uh, then you're just running a nursing home. And, <laughs> and a nursing home farm is not, I mean, I don't, I'm not opposed to nursing homes, uh, but I'm just saying a, a, a nursing home farm is, is not. We lost him, right? Oh, he, he warned us this could happen from his the, yeah. But he says he'll be back on again. Look, we can, what, I can we, I can tell you um, some of the things that you run into. I tried raising some of the uh, commercial birds, and uh, I didn't know that you couldn't keep them past like twelve weeks, or they have heart attacks and broken legs. But they do. And I learned that the hard way on my farm. Uh, most of them died of broken legs and heart attacks because I thought I would keep them for the same amount of time that I kept my other chickens. Yet that breed that I was raising is about 99% of all the chickens that are raised in, in this country. Um, the other thing is when hogs get to 250 or 300 pounds, once they get beyond that, they start having health issues. And uh, even if the farmer had space for them, the, the, the processing facilities aren't equipped to deal with an animal that large. And then finally, you know, we've got the most elasticity in the in cattle they are typically about two years old when they're slaughtered some may some may be slaughtered at 18 months and some may be slaughtered at 30 months 
But once you go past 30 months, the USDA has another set of regulations that kick in. You can't get a T-bone out of an animal that's past 30 months because um, they've observed that there's never been a case of mad cow disease in an animal under 30 months old. So once you pass that 30 month threshold, you can still have the animal butchered, but it's butchered in a different way and it's slaughtered in a different way that takes more time and doesn't produce the same cuts of meat. Uh, so anyways, these are, these are some of the reasons why you can't keep animals on the farm forever. Also, new animals are being born. It's like a pipeline, and you have to make space for the new animals. And people say, well, why don't you just feed, uh, why don't you just buy some feed? Isn't the price of corn down? Well, the price of corn is down, but I'm feeding them grass, and you, you only have so much grass. You can't, like, buy grass, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, hey, Joel. Maybe, um, maybe answer Congressman Massey. Just start that last answer over again, if you remember the question, and we'll probably cut and paste and just uh, replace the answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure when I froze out there, but yeah, the the basic um, the, the basic answer is that animals grow on a trajectory, and and uh, whether they're eating grass, feed, whatever, you can't keep you can't keep an animal. Uh, that's not growing anymore. And so if you, just like a tomato plant, if a, if a tomato plant doesn't produce uh, tomatoes, you don't water and feed it uh, and weed it, you, um, you, know, you, you replace it with another plant. And so, uh, so, so you know, the idea of running a, a nursing home farm you know, for a bunch of animals that have matured and gotten old and you're just uh, running around with toothless cows trying to keep them alive. I mean, that's not a very, you know, that's not a very uh, going concern. <laughs> so, so there's a there's a harvest. There's a harvest time that has to be done, or you or you go into bankruptcy. Why don't we? Um, uh, well, two more questions for you guys, and then I'll let you go. But uh, one obvious question is: Should we? What should we tell people to do? Because uh, I think a lot of people watching this show are learning things for the first time. And, and obviously, we want them to make sure that their members of Congress know about this, this very clear, very simple fix that you proposed. But, but how do we get the word out on this? Well, I can speak from behind the enemy lines on this point. I used to think that sending a letter was the most effective way to contact your congressman or senator, but it turns out phone calls are the most effective. And so um, I, my colleagues have received a lot of phone calls on this bill. Uh, people are learning about this bill. They're going to the grocery store. They're seeing that the shelves are empty. And so they've got uh, consumers have got an interest in it. And so they're calling their congressman. And I've picked up like 18 co-sponsors in the last 10 days because people made phone calls. Don't think that you can go on Facebook and um, and like tag your congressman and get them to support this bill. Don't at them on Twitter. And even if you've got the best penmanship in the world, what happens with your letter is it goes in a bin with all the similar letters. And there's one letter that's written in response to maybe 100 letters. Whereas if you make a phone call, every single phone call has to be responded to individually by a staff member. Don't tell me your congressman doesn't answer the phone. They, they have to. It might be another congressman calling. They all answer their phone. So, uh, it, and it does make a difference. You don't need to make 100 phone calls. To, you know, 12 will work. 12 phone calls to one congressional office is off the charts, frankly, on one single topic. And don't call Nancy Pelosi and don't call Mitch McConnell unless they are your, your representative or senator. You, you know, we have caller ID in Congress believe it or not, and we know if you're calling from the district or not, and the, the um, staff may be polite to you, but they're not writing down anything you say unless your caller ID matches up with the voting base. Joel, could I ask you um, probably a bigger question, and you've been blogging about this quite a bit, and you, you very much believe in bottom-up individual responsibility, and that, that applies to health as well. And uh, 10 million years ago, when I worked on Capitol Hill, we tried to repeal the federal sugar program. And mm. one, of the, one of the perversions of the, of the federal sugar program is it creates um, a very strong incentive. It raises the price of sugar, creates an incentive to produce shift production to corn syrup. And 
that has created generations of healthy people and things like type two diabetes or an epidemic in this country. Talk a little bit about the relationship between, you know, we're, we're facing this virus, we're facing this crisis, but you believe that, that eating right and being healthy is the best defense. Is that, is that a fair representation? Well, yes, yes it is. And I've gone on record at this pretty aggressively. Uh, this is some of my very first blogging when, the first, when it first started. And uh, I, I pointed out, and it's still true, that in these daily uh, news briefings on the coronavirus, I am waiting for somebody, anybody, anybody to stand up and say, look folks, we need to start talking about Im immunological function, immune health. How do we build immune health? And, and you know, you, look, you can't solve everybody's problem, but you can sure stop drinking three Coca-Colas a day. And you can sure start forgiving the people you resent uh, and, and just release that, you know, resentment and start to free yourself from the enslavement of, of resentment and vengeance. You can, you can sleep more, you know, uh, get nine hours of sleep a couple nights and see how you feel. Uh, get outside, exercise, go barefoot in the, we're, we're telling our customers, come out to the farm and walk barefoot through the pasture and stick your hands in a compost pile, build your bike microbiome, you know, uh, this is this is just basic, basic uh, immunological function, and eat, you know, hydrate, drink more water. Uh, nobody drinks enough water because um, water tastes so bad. So get a little purifier so it tastes good, and and then drink a gallon a day, and uh, get yourself hydrated, and, and eat you know eat better, eat uh, you know eat eat good food, and certainly don't eat you know veggie burgers and fake meat and all that stuff. Uh, you know, eat some, eat some real food, some nutrient dense stuff and, um, and, and, you know, put some attention on it is what I'm saying. And, and, and I understand there are a few healthy people that are getting this, but not very many, not very many. Most, the lion's share, if you took, if you took all the people that have gotten COVID or the, that allegedly have gotten COVID, I don't want to give anybody a, you know, I'm not going to posit anything right now but if you take all the allegations of covid and you tease out all the people all the people who um who had any kind of underlying situation including mental and spiritual disorder uh it's not very many it would be so few that other things would be a lot more important so let's put some, let's take it and put some national attention on immunity. I mean, the fact that we have this and we still see the, the, the Coca-Cola truck driving down the interstate uh, is cause for great despair, in my opinion. Congressman, is there, is there an exit strategy? I'm, I'm not sure how we get out of this. It, it looks like uh, your colleagues want to spend uh, trillions of more uh, in money that they don't have and I'm not sure where that's coming from, but but one thing that we haven't really talked about is the potential that locking people in their homes for two months is actually really bad and really dangerous. And and there was some interesting data that came out of uh, uh, Go Governor Cuomo and New York has looked at the data. And I think I'll quote this right, that the most recent data uh, in New York shows that um, that the people that were locked in we're actually getting the virus uh, at a much higher rate than people that were going to work, including healthcare workers. And then the governor said, "Wow, I didn't expect that." And and I just don't I don't think we know enough that that to to cede all of this authority to Washington D.C. So, what what are you going to do to save us? Save us. <laughs> Well, listen, the, the, the cure that the government has proposed so far is worse than the disease. They're giving money to small businesses to try and keep them afloat. Meanwhile, they're, and they're saying, if you keep everybody employed, then you can get the loan forgiven. But meanwhile, they're telling their employees, if you stay home and don't go back to work, we'll give you another $600 a week. So the government's pushing on the gas and the brake at the same time. As far as the food supply, the government has no answer. Uh, they, the people who are against the Prime Act, they need to provide their own solution. 
um, we're in this Orwellian situation right now where the U.S. Department of Agriculture, these are ostensibly the folks that are making sure that our food supply is healthy and, and robust and secure, their, their role in this virus so far has been to um, teach farmers how to efficiently waste and destroy their farm animals. Like they're not figuring out how to get them processed. They're not entertaining the Prime Act. They're going to farms and saying, we'll pay you money and, uh, for your loss and here's how to destroy the animal and how to compost it in the, in the best way. That's ridiculous. And um, their, their solution is worse than the disease in my opinion. And we're gonna be paying uh, the long-term, you know, there's going to be a long-term effect from this way down the road. What we what we shouldn't do is go back to Congress in, in three or four weeks and pass another trillion-dollar stimulus bill. The governors need to open their economies back up. We shouldn't be paying them to keep it shut down because it'll just keep going. You know, the money that we're injecting into the economy, it doesn't cause food to show up on the table. It doesn't cause um, you know, dishwashers and refrigerators and cars to be manufactured. It's like um, giving a blood transfusion to a patient who is bleeding. We need to stop the bleeding. We have, the patient is the economy, the arteries are severed. We need to cauterize the situation. We need to stitch the patient back up before we do another blood transfusion. Otherwise, we're just encouraging and, and keeping things on life support. Okay, so uh, if if there's any final thoughts, uh, I'd love to entertain those. I would say don't ever expect to buy the world's best food at you know junk food prices. That's not going to happen. Uh, if you want the nutrient dense food, not the stuff that's been brined uh, to to be saltier and have more weight in it, uh, then go to a local farm and expect to pay a little bit more. Okay, but what you're gaining though is it caught it. You will get more quality uh, for this for the same price in some aspects because you don't have to pay for all the fuel to send the, the the calves out to Nebraska and then to have them process there and all the fuel that comes back to uh, Kentucky or Virginia. Uh, that money won't be wasted. It won't destroy the environment. It'll go toward making healthier food. But even then, you might have to pay a little bit more. But you'll never wonder if it's not gonna be there tomorrow. If you support a farmer, the farmer will survive. And then you'll, like Joel was saying, that he's got customers that would gladly pay $500 a year to be at the top of his list and get that food security. So, you, you know, people are gonna, they don't have to give up any freedom and they're gonna get more security if they buy locally. So that's, all, that's also part of what you're paying for when you, when you buy local. Yeah, I would simply add to that. Yeah, Thomas is exactly right. Uh, you get what you pay for. And, and I would say, you know, I don't think that we will ever be as cheap as the externalized costed, uh, you know, uh, industrial fare, uh, no matter what happens, because, you know, they're not paying for the dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico. They're not paying for the 50% of all diarrhea that's caused by uh, foodborne pathogens. They're not, you know, so there's a lot of externalized costs, but, but the Prime Act would mitigate, that's the word, it would mitigate, um, it would mitigate a, a, a healthy percentage of this, um, of, of both the, the problem with availability and the problem with price. It would mitigate both availability and price in, in the food system. And anything we can do to take off arbitrary bottlenecks and arbitrary costs is a good thing. And the other thing it does is it lets you get into the market at a, at a lower price point. Because right now, if you want to strike up a relationship with a farmer and use a custom slaughterhouse that's not you uh, doesn't have a USDA employee full time, you have to buy half a cow, and that that's hundreds of dollars, if not a thousand dollars, of meat, and right. put it in a freezer. And then hope that your electricity from your conglomerate, you know, that's supplying it through a wire, uh, it's also externalizing their costs. You hope that they can supply you electricity until your family's able to eat all that. Otherwise, you're going to have the biggest barbecue your neighbor's ever seen if your freezer fails. So there's um, what the Prime Act does is it's 
is it's um, it's it it enables the lower and middle class to eat the foods that only the upper middle class and the, and the upper class can now enjoy because it lowers the price uh, entry for getting into that market. It, it allows you to buy smaller volumes at a time so you can, so you can uh, get into it at a, at, a, at a smaller total amount. You can get into it with, the, with, with a, a, a couple pounds of hamburger instead of a half of beef. That's, right. a, that's a real different entry point. We're talking it's a, about it's, it's a democratized it's a democratized entry point. So basically, one bite at a time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, that was that was bad. That was so bad. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, guys. That was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for letting me go on a Zoom meeting with my hero. Yeah. Joel, my farm wants to be Polyface Farm when it grows up. But but seriously, we um we never all talk together about this, but. But uh, Joel, I don't know if you've ever seen Off the Grid with Thomas Massey, um, but I, I'd love to do a follow up maybe on your farm with mm -hmm. Thomas Massey and sort of sort of take it to the next step because I think a lot of stuff you're doing is is uh, well, it's 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 radical, lunatic, anarchist, <laughs> Christian, libertarian farming. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd be I'd be delighted and honored to do it. Any any minute I get to spend with Thomas Massey is a minute. Uh, is a minute of memory and uh, and and uh, whatever emotional equity in my life. So it's a real treat. Uh, we're open 24/7, 365. We're still open 3, uh, 24/7, 365. And uh, you're welcome anytime. Thanks again for doing this, and thank you, Congressman. And thank, thank you. you. I, I was haunt, when thank I hauled you. some cattle to the processor last week. I, I might have been going over the speed limit, and I thought if I got pulled over. I would cite the Defense Production Act to the uh, to the officer, <laughs> and, and you know say it was an executive order. But in all in in all seriousness, uh, this is Joel Salatin's moment to shine. I mean, what he's been writing about his books, the interns that he's taught who've gone out and started farming the way that he farms, uh, he is he's proven right. Right now, today, you heard him. He's not euthanizing animals. He's not breaking eggs. He's providing more food than he's ever provided before. And it's safe and it's sustainable and it's healthy and it's local and it's stimulating his local economy and providing jobs. I mean, meanwhile, this other system that's a uh, you know, result of overregulation and lobbyists being in Washington, D.C. for too long is breaking down and shelves are going empty. So uh, find it, you know, everybody can't shop at Joel Salatin's place. Mm. But find a local farmer and strike up a conversation with them and ask them, you know, if I wanted to cut out the Chinese and Brazilian middlemen, how would we go about doing this? And right. take those uh, things into your own hands. And maybe that farmer will be as generous as Joel Salatin and let you put your hands in the compost pile <laughs> to, to build up your biology. <laughs> well, you spent all your time in Washington, D.C., I assume jumping over piles like that. Yeah. <laughs> it is a big compost pile in this wall. <laughs> Thank you both. This has been awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.